art for me growing up was also um, a way of connecting with family. Um, and that is, that is still true today. Um, my father was a tremendous inspiration for me when I was younger and, and, and he still is, we're still, you know, he's 88 and we're still taking museum trips together, but I was one of four kids and, um, and it was, it was hard to get your time in the sun. You know, there was a lot going on and everybody had things. Um, but I was the one who liked going to museums with my dad, the, my, my brother and sisters, you know, that wasn't their thing. And so that was, that was very special time for me, um, that I got to do that. Um, my father knew how to draw. I remember him drawing for me, um, but he made his turn in his life and went into medicine. Um, so I think he always had a lot of respect for it and, um, and he really nurtured it. Um, one of my, my favorite stories from this period is that um, he took me, he, when I was 13, he signed me up for art classes at the Brooklyn Museum and they were figure drawing classes. And I, I didn't know what that meant. And my mom certainly didn't know what that meant. And um, the first day I got there, I discovered that it was nude models. And I was like, oh my God, why is this person taking their clothes off in front of us? I was like, I was overwhelmed. And I just quietly sat in the back and did my drawings and um, got home and showed my mom what, you know, she asked to see what I had made at the drawing class. And um, needless to say, she was pretty mad at my dad when, when she found out that I was, I was drawing nude models um, at 13 years old. But she, um, she, she let it be and she let me go back. And it was, um, it was a, a really inspirational experience for me. Um, art in my childhood was about experiencing the world. Um, so I, uh, I did some digging this past week and I still, I still have sketchbooks from middle school. Um, and in my sketchbooks from middle school, I found some of my earliest responses to political events. Um, so the Iran hostage crisis um, was really my first consciousness of events that were happening beyond me um, in, in the broader world. And, and I, and I, you know, they spoke to me, I responded to them and, and it, from that age, really helped me process, um, process what was going on. Um, I also experienced the world through travel. Um, so I am fortunate to have family that lives abroad. Um, I was fortunate to have friends who invited me to visit them on their semesters abroad in college. And I spent a lot of summers in Europe. Um, and my sketchbook was always with me. Um, it, you know, Arlene talked about that piece of her work and her, her little watercolor studies. Um, it, it is, it's a way of remembering things. Um, to this day, I still keep a travel journal. Um, I still keep my sketchbook. It's, it's, you know, it's those things that maybe don't make it into a photo album or a story that you don't want to forget. Um, I included this slide down below. I apologize, my photo of it is a little blurry, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty special to me because I recently was on a trip with my daughter to France and we went into a park and I looked at a sculpture and I said, Hannah, I, I think I've painted that sculpture. I think I painted that. I have a memory of this. And, and we both went, oh, that's, you know, that's kind of interesting. And last week when I was looking for images for this presentation, I came across this slide which is exactly the sculpture that we were looking at together. So again, like it's just this full circle of art kind of making connections, you know, making connections now with, with my children. Um, art in my, um, in my teenage years really taught me to rely on myself. Um, I think among all of my lessons, um, that 
that was perhaps one of the most important ones um, and one of the hardest ones to learn that you, you, you can't hold on to other people's opinion of you, that you have to be able to, to hear and listen and, and let go. Um, I think certainly, you know, experiencing critiques as an art student trains you in that. Um, but I, you know, I also, um, have some, like, like many of us artists have, have my, uh, my traumatic art teacher story, um, that really, really shaped my entire life. Um, and, um, gosh, I don't know where to start with this story. Um, this story, I actually did a Ted talk on this story and that's on this slide, but I don't, I don't know that I should play the whole Ted talk. It's about seven minutes long. Um, we can decide maybe at the end if it's something we want to revisit, but I'll, I'll just briefly give you the story. Um, I went to school in a uh, very small school. There was only one art teacher. Um, and that art teacher did not think I was very good. Um, and he thought my best friend was fabulous. Um, and I just kept working, even though I, I didn't have his support because it was really personal to me. Um, there was one story in my senior year where he invited the, the six senior art students to um, on a field trip to a gallery in Manhattan. Um, and he told all the other art students to bring their portfolios, um, but he did not tell me to bring my portfolio. And even in those days, I always had a sketchbook with me. Um, so we went to the gallery and, you know, everybody took turns visiting with the gallery owner and they had their beautiful finished pieces. Um, and the gallery owner got to me, I was the last person. And he said, you know, come show me your work. And I said, well, I don't, I don't have anything with me. I only have this sketchbook. And, um, and this is, <laughs> This is this is the sketchbook. Um, and he said, well, you know, come inside. We'll we'll look in your sketchbook. And he landed on the drawing that I have on the screen. Um, and I don't know if he was being kind. I don't know if he was being sincere. He's a gallery owner. So I'm thinking he was speaking his truth They're They're not so warm and fuzzy. Um, and he went on to praise me for this little sketch. Um, and he talked about the, the um, you know, the intuitiveness of the line and the lights and the darks and how it was very expressive. And all I was thinking was it's a branch and a, a leaf, what are you seeing? Um, but it really, um, it really shook me up and, and oddly upset me. Um, and it upset me because I had spent my entire student life thinking that the opinion of my art teacher was like the sole opinion in the world on my art. And while it was liberating to find out that it wasn't, it was also very jarring. Um, I was a hothead. <laughs> I was a hothead when, when, and I'm still, when you, when you get, I have a very long fuse, but when you get me to the end of it, I'm, I'm a hothead. And um, I went back to work and to school rather, and gave him a piece of my mind and, um, and was freed and was freed from that and um, went on to study art, went on to become an art teacher um, and share this lesson. I, I would share this lesson with my students every year that my opinion was just one opinion and I had years of experience and they were welcome to listen to me or not listen to me um, based on that experience. But he really um, his negative teachings really grounded me in, in who I wanted to be. Um, so, uh, I went to, I went to school. I, um, let's, oh, sorry, not trying to do that. Um, when I was in college, um, I explored a lot of different materials. I loved photography in high school. Um, I drew, I painted, I sculpted, I still do a lot of different materials. I'm not, I'm not tied 
I have things that I'm most comfortable with, but I'm not tied with any one thing. Um, but as my, as my college years went on, um, I found myself really um, connecting, again, like connecting with myself and looking at um, my heritage. So my family um, is from Syria and Egypt and Italy. Um, I connect a lot with the Egyptian culture. Um, a lot of the symbolism in it speaks to me. Um, and I started studying ancient scripts, um, not in terms of their meaning, but in terms of their design elements. Um, and I started turning those forms into these very three-dimensional looking structures. Um, sometimes they looked like musical instruments, like the image on the left. Um, sometimes they looked like stained glass. Um, I just kind of was really exploring how to take writing and, and approach it as, as design. Um, so that, that is my, those are my origin stories. That's where everything kind of started. And so, um, I, in my, in my early days of making art, um, I don't think I was very good. I wasn't very good. You know, I think we all travel our road to learn different skills, but I was always very expressive. And I think when I got to college, I really started, it, it, things started coming together for me in terms of both technique and expressive content. But expressive content has always been the center point of my work for me. Um, and I think having a passion for things is just a center point for who I am. I don't, I don't engage in, in the mundane. Um, I mean, I guess we all do have to a little bit, but, but uh, when I get involved in something and truly involved in it, it's, it's because I'm passionate. And I think a lot of us are like that. I think a lot of us are like that. Um, so I started teaching um, right out of college. I was barely 22. When I started, I had students who were seniors. Um, so they were just a couple of years younger than me. As you can see, I looked very young. Um, I used to dress up as an art teacher. I used to wear, have a briefcase and pull my hair back and wear heels. I would do anything to look older. Um, and I failed all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I stayed at the same school I taught in my entire life. Um, I met my husband there. This is my husband. And um, I started graduate school. So as a teacher, um, you have five years from your first teaching job to get your master's degree. So I would teach during the day and then I would drive over to the College of New Rochelle at night and um, do my master's degree. I started my master's degree in art therapy. Um, I was very interested in art therapy and I did, <laughs> I did almost my whole degree, um, except the internship, which I didn't know about. I don't know how, I, I think I was really a very naive child. I think I just kind of went through the world. Um, and I got to the last year and found out I had to do a full-time unpaid internship. And Excuse me, Nancy, where did you spend your whole career teaching? What school? Oh, I'm sorry. Clarkstown High School North. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I grew up in Brooklyn, but um, a different story for a different day. I, I landed in Rockland County um, at Clarkstown, and my family thought I was moving to the woods. They were like, where are you going? It's the woods. Um, there's no streetlights on 9W. Um, so, um, I got to that last year and I wasn't tenured yet as a teacher and I had a decision to make of what career I wanted to go towards. Um, and I chose, I chose, I loved them both. Um, but I realized that I, I, I didn't think I had the, I didn't think I was tough enough to be an art therapist. Um, I internalize everything. Um, 
you know, every, every problem my students have, every situation um, I bring, I brought home with me. Um, I was involved in their whole lives and, and summer was like this little tiny snippet of recharge. But I, I thought, gosh, if I did art therapy, I, I, would, I would be internalizing things that were just too hard for me. Um, so I went towards teaching um, and I don't regret a second of it. Um, and the art therapy degree really informed my teaching practice. Um, for me, teaching was always about, these are all works for my graduate program. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but teaching was always about teaching life. It was about teaching life and art happened to be the, the tool that I did that with. And if you learned perspective, great. And if you didn't, I knew your life would be full, you know, <laughs> would be, would be great, could still be great. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad with the decision I made. Um, this is a large scale watercolor. Um, it's about four feet by four feet. It is again, that observing of little details. My, my thesis project in graduate school was to paint white objects with color to define white objects. So there, I have a whole series of paintings that are all white objects, but being defined with, with color. Um, this is the, it looks, a lot of people think it's a sewing machine. Um, it's actually the centerboard of a sailboat that my husband and I used to race um, right outside your window, Arlene. Um, we were part of the Nyack Boat Club and we used to do weekend races. <clears throat> um, I like working close up. I like people having to slow down and, and really look. I think it's very easy to walk past a piece of art, um, especially in a school environment. You know, you hang showcases all the time and people maybe look at it, kids look at it to fix their hair and the reflection of the window but they, of the showcase, but they don't really see. Um, I was very inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe in my youth um, and her you know, her desire to, to get people to just slow down a little bit and appreciate the little things. And as I'd mentioned earlier, that, you know, that was a lesson from my childhood for sure. Um, I, in graduate school, was also engaged in photography. Photography comes and goes in my life since high school. Um, I'm really passionate about it. Um, and it creates an outlet for me when maybe I don't have time to sit down for six months and work on a drawing while a young child is tugging at my leg. You know, um, I have a dark room in my house. I've always had it. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I think I also, what I like about photography is that everybody in the world sees the same thing. I'm not inventing something necessarily but the way that I perceive it and the way that I photograph it or crop it. Um, and to me, that presents a really interesting challenge. So, you know, I've often talked to my students about the fact that photography gets dismissed. Oh, it's so easy, you just click a button. Um, and what I always say is, you know, the clicking of the button is the last step. What, what, the photograph is, is all of the consideration, all of the experience, all of the seeing. Um, so this is garlic. Um, I almost got censored from a show once at the Arts Council of Rockland because they thought it was breasts. Funny story. Back in uh, 90, I think, height of our censorship years, right? that we're going back to. <laughs> um, this again was our boat. So I did, um, I often use photographs as reference um, and I feel blessed that I can use photos as reference but still bring life experience to my work and expression to my work 
um, I will often photograph things um, to come back to because I just want to spend time with it. But then I don't burden myself with working photorealistically in my drawings. Um, so other life experiences, um, I got into underwater photography. My, my husband and I um, traveled. We experienced the world before we had kids and, and after we had kids. But um, even in my underwater photography, I was, I was always interested in kind of abstracting things. So um, this was a really fortunate moment where not only did I find an octopus, I was able to photograph it. Um, they, they don't like being around people. So, um, so this, this was a, a fortunate moment for me. Um, my husband and I, just before we had kids, um, started a project together. So my husband was a history teacher um, and we had started a project in the 90s, um, late 90s, that we, we were gonna write a book together. Um, and the book was going to be called The Voices of the Millennium. And we started seeking out individuals who were born between 1900 and 1910 and interviewing them. We came up with a list of questions um, on different topics and I would photograph them and my husband would interview them. And we have cassette tapes of these interviews. Jim, I think of you when I, you know, when I, when I think of this project. Um, and we probably got through maybe just under 10 interviews. Um, and then we had kids <laughs> and there, there, the story shifts, there, the story shifts, um, to the year 2000 came and went, they were no longer voices of the millennium. And, you know, we kind of put it in a box and, uh, and moved on, moved on to the next project. Um, but art in my life, raising a family, um, was like my mother was everywhere, um, and existed in all different materials. Um, when I was pregnant with each of my kids, I, um, I made each of them a quilt and the quilts the the writing is embroidered lettering it's all hand stitched um i didn't have a a uh a means by you know doing this type of lettering i i believe i did the patchwork on a sewing machine um the fabric was important to me the um the white forms that are on the blue field so my first child was my son and the white fabric that I used was all fabric um, that came from shirts that were my husband and my shirts, because I, I wanted to just my son in, in, in us, you know? And then when I made my daughter's quilt, um, the four fish were symbolic of our four family members. And now I used, again, materials from my husband and I, but also, um, clothing from my son. Um, to this day, I still kind of like working this way. I just recently made a baby quilt for my, my first great nephew, uh, niece, and the quilt is all made from shirts that belong to her parents that they sent me that felt important to them. Um, so I feel like my work always has a lot of symbolism in it, a lot of, a lot of hidden meaning, a lot of things that are personal to me that maybe you'll look at it and say, oh, that's neat. But then there's this other layer of it that's, that's personal. Um, things became smaller and quicker. <laughs> you know, my son napping on me, you know, became this little sketch on lined paper. It didn't, didn't much matter what I was working on. And I, I felt like I just wanted to remember everything. Gosh, it's, you know, their, their little voices and their little bodies and their little motions. Like I just, I just wanted to hold on to all of it, to all of it. And, you know, obviously that's, 
that's hard to do. But when I look back at this page of sketches, like I remember that pose, I remember that stretch, I remember that moment, you know, and that's, that's really special to me. I like, I observed them like, like, oh my God, I, you know, it's like, oh my God, the chapped lip, the toe curl, the, like everything was so inspiring to me. Every little thing, my daughter's little curls, like every little thing was so inspiring to me and became my work. Um, our family portraits became symbolic. You know, I was like, wow, we all have different size shoes or tees or toothbrushes or whatever. Like this all became my, my family portraiture. Um, and I'm going to skip the next two because they're a little out of sync. And I, I always engaged them in work. Um, you know, I mentioned my Saturday morning outings. I also, we have, <laughs> we have a house up in Cape Cod and um, it has very big foundation walls that are really, really ugly. Um, and it, it, it used to drive me crazy. And I just said, that's it. We're painting murals on the house. And um this house has become an art project. I mean, there's, there's a different freedom that I feel with that house. Like I would in New York, I would never just paint on the outside of my house. People would think I was crazy, but in Cape Cod, it's like anything goes, you know? So, um, so this was a first mural that we painted together. Um, it's, it's still there. There's many that have, um, that have joined it. Um, this is a mosaic that we made in our outdoor shower. Um, and so they're just kind of fun records of our, our time together there. Um, art in, in my adult life involved being involved with my kids' schools. So I would go into their school and paint murals with their classes. Um, I did projects, this project, gosh, this involved the entire elementary school. I photographed every student in the school and um, transferred those images onto tiles and made a, made a flag that's in the front lobby of the school. But it was always for me to stay connected with my family. Um, when my mom passed uh, back in 2009, I, there, there was kind of a, a running joke in our family that she, she was the rooster. That was her symbol, you know? So every time I see a rooster, I'm like, oh, it's a visit from my mom. And, um, and to this day, all the ladies in the family text each other when we're somewhere and we see a rooster and like, oh, grandma's here, you know? Um, so I used to make these collages and it was, it was a way for me to stay connected, um, and honor her and, and remember her, um, in terms of art, helping me process and experience, um, you know, just like when I was a kid, there are things in our daily life that are just too much. They're just too much. And I can't, I can't wrap my brain around it. Um, you know, when the, when the Twin Towers were hit, um, I, that, that certainly was the case. And going down and photographing the lights just grounded me a little bit. It connected me a little bit. Um, all my years of Trump anger um, turned me into a knitter. Uh, I thought I, I thought I had let that, that go. I don't know if you can see on my, my shelf back, back there. Um, there's piles of yarn and hats and I just, you know, every time he made a stupid statement or decision, I, I would knit a hat. In fact, many of these hats on the inside have a tag saying his stupid thing that he said, whatever it was. And, um, I couldn't keep up. I couldn't keep up. Like I couldn't <laughs> knit fast enough because just, and I'm sorry, I'm being political, but you know, <laughs> it's my show today. So um, I often keep my politics to myself, but um, I just couldn't knit fast enough because the comments were coming like crazy. So I would send them to friends and family. And I think there's a picture with my cat 
somewhere in one of them. Oh, it's not in this set. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just my way of expressing myself. In fact, this past weekend, um, after the road decision on Friday, uh, my husband and I went to the protest down in New City. And like one of the first things I thought was like, oh my God, I, I have to make protest signs. I, I like, I, I have to, I have to start. And, and it, it was like, it was like, I, I, the first, my first comfort was art. Like, okay, this is going to be another long haul. I gotta, I gotta start making art and, 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 and speaking. Um, so that, that, those are spaces where art directly connected with my family and my work life in, in my adult life. But um, I, I want to move on now and talk about the role that art played as, as a teacher. Um, but maybe, again, if this is a moment where anyone, you know, had a question that you, or a statement that you felt like you, you needed to say now, um, we could do that or we could wait to the end. So if you have anything, give me a hand raise, otherwise I'll keep talking. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking. What'd you say, Sally? I can't hear you. Say how lucky you are that you can express this because when I looked at those uh, pink hats, all of us have this frustration, or some of us do, where we keep inside where you're able to express it through different modalities. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it really, um, yeah, it really is helpful. And, and I think we all have that in different ways. Some people cook, some people garden, some people exercise, but yeah, it, it, it definitely is my, um, my go-to therapy. <laughs> so, um, so I, I taught for 33 years. Um, I could probably speak to you for three weeks on my career. Um, and I think what I, what I want to speak about is the favorite part of my career. Um, I taught everything. Um, I loved teaching everything. I, I taught art history, clay, photography, drawing, painting, computer graphics. I, I, you know, I loved all of it because I love learning new things. Um, so that part was amazing to me. Um, but really my, my favorite part of my job was the lessons that I got to teach my students beyond my classroom walls. Um, I had some really great moments of travel with them, which I'll get to in a moment, but I also had some really great moments of working on big projects, collaborative projects. I love, I love collaborative projects. Um, in fact, in, in one of my early years, um, well, I guess not that early. I've been <laughs> teaching over 10 years at that point, but um, I had the amazing good fortune to, um, to be accepted uh, by Jean-Claude and Christo to work on their Gates project um, in Manhattan. Uh, I imagine many of you remember that, that project with the orange, orange flags in Central Park. Um, and originally the project was supposed to be installed on my February break. Um, and then the, the timeline of the project changed and it was the, the week before or after February break, I can't remember. And so I had to take leave from work for five days. Um, at the time, I had an absolutely incredible superintendent um, and we made a deal that I would use my three personal days um, and he would give me two school business days um, and in return, every day, I would communicate with my students. I would share my experience from the day. And then after the project was over, I took a field trip with them. And we went to the part of the gates that I installed. Um, that's my team. Um, 
And we installed a hundred structures in four and a half days. Um, and, and it, it was one of the most profound things, artistic experiences I have had in my life. Can uh, I ask you something about it or should sure. I wait? To no, no, anytime, interrupt me, okay. everybody. This is Karen, um, I remember those days um, when I read about it being installed and I thought it was the most stupid thing I had ever heard of. I didn't see any value in it. And I have friends who went there, I never did go there, mm -hmm. who said it was wonderful. And I, to this day, I don't understand the value of that. Yeah, archive. I would love to speak to that. I'm trying to find my presentation. Sorry, a call just came in while I was talking. Um, oh, darn. And, okay. and yet you uh, just referred to it as flags those gates were flags well it was cloth so i'm going to figure out how to turn off my phone bear with me <laughs> <laughs> i'll skip having the timer while you do that nancy i want to just speak to karen karen i went with my husband i still have a piece of fabric i don't know it fell off or something i promise i didn't uh, take it off and right. it was the most amazing thing in person that you could ever imagine with all That's what my that friend said, but explain it to me because i don't I'll, get it. i'll tell you for bear, me bear with me I, I'll be interested what Nancy says, but for me as a spectator, it was stark. If you see it was winter, it was very stark. And here's this magnificent color all over Central Park with all these millions of people. It was like, it put us in community with each other when a, in a very real way with this color and energy and people and just so happy to be out. So for me, it was amazing. I'm sorry you missed it and uh -huh. it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add, uh, I, I was at, at that time, I, I flew in to see this because I was living in California. And what I got out of it was the exuberance of the people that were walking there. It definitely gave New Yorkers a sense of community. And what amazed me was there were people, the weather was very cold. I remember it was six degrees the, the day that I went there. And there were people that were dressed in ballet, um, outfits dancing in this freezing weather and people were taking pictures and there was one couple that had gotten married and came there and there was it was it was what the way Sally said it brought New Yorkers together in a way that I had never seen before well uh -huh. I think I think also um this was all post 9-11 mm -hmm. and at Bloomberg was the mayor at the time. And um, this was the first positive thing that happened in New York after 9-11. People didn't want to come to the city. Um, I was scared to go into the city. I, I wouldn't drive on bridges for the longest time. And it, it made New Yorkers joyous. So I think, you know, Christo's work in general, the thing to know about Christo's work, and he wraps all sorts of things, islands and bridges, and, and, and his work only stays wrapped for two weeks. And he does that because he wants to make people make the time, make the time to experience it and not take it for granted. You know, we always say, oh, we'll do that tomorrow. We'll do that the next day. <laughs> you had to be a part of it. And there was something really extraordinary. There was something surreal about walking through this structure. There was something surreal about man-made and nature living together um, and coexisting so beautifully. And, uh, and I will tell you that when we built it, we were given very specific instructions. You know, you could not move a branch. You could not impact anything that was already there. Um, it was really intense, intense work. Um, I, I was up at five in the morning. To this day, when I wake up on a cold morning in the winter and it's dark out, this experience comes back to me. Um, and, it, and it's really a positive experience because I was entering the city when it was quiet and there was no one there. And I was walking through this park that in my childhood was dangerous and scary. And I felt confident. I felt part of something bigger than me. Um, yeah, it was, it was, 
I got bitten in the face by a dog, hence the bandage on my nose. I mean, it was oh. the whole package. It was the whole, <laughs> you, you could see I was pretty gritty by the end of the week. <laughs> um, Thank you for explaining. I'm, I'm getting it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I always say I love, I love going, I love going to see abstract art and non-objective art with people because it, because I too, what the heck is this? And why is it in a museum, you know? And then when I sit with someone and explain and talk about it, you still may not like it, but you might understand it and appreciate it. And really that's all that, that really matters. You know, we're not all gonna like the same, the same art. Right. So, oh, I, um, I, yes, Sally. I just wanted to make a comment uh, that it, I think what was amazing for me is to take on a project of that magnitude and believe that you can do it, believe that you can make yeah. it happen. Like he had a vision. I want to br bring the, in this stark, cold time, mm -hmm. I'm going to make something bright happen and I'm going to engage people. And he mm -hmm. did. So whether you wanted to go there or just the fact that he had this goal and look at how happy those people, your team is. And mm -hmm. I had the same feeling. I think what Arlene said, that joyousness, people were walking around and you were in community with people you didn't know. And the one thing I saw was a lot of older people sitting, just sitting by themselves on a bench, but feel, feeling, looking happy because mm -hmm. they were there with people instead of being in their apartments where it's cold and dark mm -hmm. and alone, they were, um, they were, they were in community and I just it was just to me I've I felt like Karen did what the heck is this yeah I went down there it moved me that's what I was going to just say I think it's hard to um to really appreciate it in pictures I think it's a it's a very visceral his work sure. creates a very visceral experience yeah. you know um and I think his his last, uh, Christo's last um, happening was the walk on water, which of course I didn't get to see. It was in Italy on a lake, but that really captured my imagination. Imagine the thought of being able to walk on water and he did it and they showed pictures of it. Of course, I, I would have liked to have experienced it, but I did it, you know, just by looking at the pictures. Mm -hmm. Such a novel how, idea. How did he walk on water? How did that happen? Well, I can't go into the construction. I'm not that, <laughs> but he did it. He had the, he had raised panels. They walked on water. Trust me. You can his, look at his, his works are decades in the making. It's kind of like photography, right? His works are decades in the making in terms of um, the structural engineering, the city planning, the 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 approvals that he has to get for sites and materials and funding. Um, they're decades in the planning. And so the couple of weeks that they're installed are really like the click of a button on the camera. You know what I mean? Um, but I, 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 Sally, you hit on some important things that are kind of a great segue for me um, in that I, I too, in my career, loved big, events. I loved projects. I loved bringing a bunch of people together and, and making something that they, they couldn't imagine and that gave them a sense of community. And so um, I was very fortunate in my career to be able to do that. And I was fortunate in my position as art teacher and also art department chairperson and also well-respected member of the school because I could engage hundreds of people. I was the person who was everybody's cheerleader and they were my support system. And who doesn't want to be a part of something big and great and, and, and meaningful? Um, I was the uh, advisor for the Art Honor Society and I had as our mission, creating art in the service of others that, you know, how could you use your art to help local, school, national, global. And so every year we would take on giant projects and probably my, my biggest one was working with an organization called Charity Water. Um, Charity Water was founded by a photographer 
Um, I was drawn into it by his pictures that were stunning. Um, and basically his organization, which still exists, their offices are down on 14th street, I think. Um, his, his mission is to build wells in communities in Africa, to fundraise, to build wells in communities in Africa. I engaged the entire school over a two year period um, in fundraising to, to build a well in Africa. And when I say engage the entire school, the science department was, was teaching, you know, about water scarcity and, and pollution. And the social studies department was teaching about, you know, different aspects of history in Africa. And the art department was making art and we were doing art exchanges with kids in Africa. And like every department in the school got on board with this thing. Um, and ultimately, um, after it was almost two years, um, the culminating event was a walkathon. Um, and unfortunately, um, my mom passed away the week before the walkathon, um, which was just the worst moment in my life. Um, and all of these people who had worked with me to, to, to get this off the ground pulled in that week when I was out of school and they wanted to cancel the event. And we said, no, we're, we're gonna have the event. And so my dad and my sisters who always showed up at everything showed up and, uh, provided support and, and actually it was a moment, it was, it was one day in a horrible week where I could kind of step out of myself. Um, and so, you know, art, art saved me again. Um, and we pulled it off and we raised over $10,000 and there is now a well in the Central African Republic that has our school's name on it. Um, and, and we did that job. So, um, that was pretty incredible. That was pretty incredible. Um, I brought artists, artists in residence in regularly. Um, so there was one year where we got a grant to learn about silk screening and we made this, this is very large. This is um, four by eight, four feet by eight feet. Um, and I had many students working together to visualize the idea of democracy um, and to create this image. Um, it was a mixed media piece. Uh, can you see my arrow moving around? Uh, let's see. Yes. A little bit. Yeah. So this center panel of the uh, Washington Monument and Reflecting Pool, that's actually a mirror. And the students had this idea that um, they would include a mirror in the piece so that it was like anyone who was viewing the work became a participant in in this democracy in the in these protests for freedoms and rights um this piece is really really old still timely um it was you can see a lot of the image oh, sorry a lot of the imagery that they used was um from the uh, Berlin Wall coming down. Um, so gives you, gives you a sense of, you know, of timing. Um, one year, the Art Honor Society wanted to kind of take on the mission of the school of um, recycling and sustainability. And so they created this piece. This piece is eight feet by 16 feet. Um, it's actually four panels. It's above some lockers in the school. Um, this was a year long collection of materials that were gonna be thrown away. Um, that they saved and collected based on their colors and, and using them in the mural. Um, so you can see in the close up the types of things that they were, they were collecting, the garbage that they were collecting and getting members of the school to collect. 
Um, um, this piece was probably one of the largest ones. So this was eight feet by 16 feet. Um, this was, uh, I, we had an artist in residence, um, a Cuban artist who came to our school. He, uh, he lived with us in my house for a couple of weeks. He actually had come a second time and went to my, my children's school. Um, but he worked with every student in the art department on this mural. So kids would come out during class and work on the mural and he would talk to them about you know, their personal symbol system. And that's what fills these little bodies. Um, some of these big keywords were topics that we discussed, unity and tolerance, diversity and choice, change and trust. Um, very, very powerful experience for all of the kids watching this come, come to life. Um, we worked on a project with an international artist. His name is JR. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Um, he's done projects all around the world. Um, and we, the short story is we photographed, I guess, 200 students and teachers in the school. And it was a way of connecting our school community with the local community. So we felt because I think I think people are scared of teenagers. People are scared of teenagers and high schoolers, and um, and there's maybe like this disconnect that happens between what goes on in a school and a local community. And so we decided to bring our community outside, and so we we photographed 200 volunteers, students, and teachers, and me myself and and. Uh, two of the other art teachers in the department um, made oatmeal paste because this is what the artist JR does and pasted these on the outside of the school. So they were all around our school building facing out into the community um, and people could make whatever faces they want. Um, and it was a way of kind of building building community with, with the local community. It was a really beautiful project. The um, images were printed on paper by the artist and then sent to us. Mm. This project was done just a few years ago. Um, we had a, an international artist who lives in California um, work with us on, on her project called the Butterfly Project. Um, and that project is creating a ceramic butterfly to represent every child in the Holocaust that died. And her goal is to eventually around the world have one butterfly for each child. Um, this project became a school-wide project also. We created over a thousand butterflies um, and they are installed on an outdoor wall at the school. Um, the woman that you're looking at is a Holocaust survivor. Um, she's 97. She came to speak to the students. She was their age when she was brought to, um, to a concentration camp. Um, so that was, that was a very powerful moment um, for everybody. Um, I've taken, I'm going to move a little quicker because I see I'm running out of time. Um, I've taken students on travel experiences. Um, early in my career, we went to Russia. Um, we, went to, uh, we went to DC, we would look at art, we would make art on site. Um, we've gone out West, I've taken them hiking, we've gone to the national parks, we photograph California. Um, I've been to Colorado, Utah, Arizona with students, um, really some of my favorite, favorite moments um, is being out in the field with them. Um, so I am not getting time to show you my current work. <laughs> I, uh, I, I thought I was pacing myself, but I lost a few minutes. I can, I can quickly run through it um, and just, you know, tell you about this, 
this last year briefly. If anyone wants to hear more, I can stay on with you. Um, when my son was born, right before my son was born, I made this very large charcoal drawing. Um, it's got some acrylic paint. It is uh, probably three feet by four feet of pine cones. And I had started a second one and then I never got back to it and I never threw it out and I knew exactly where it was. And this past year I came back to it. Um, and I spent probably the better part of six months working on it. Um, again, it was very symbolic for me. It was like this bookend to come back to making art um, in, a, in a more full-time capacity. Um, it was representative for me because a lot of the pine cones and imagery that's in this one were found this year on my vacation. So I went to Santa Fe, I came home with a pine cone. I went to Colorado, I came home with a pine cone. I went to France, I came home with a pine cone. Um, and so it, it, this piece to me, while I don't think it's my strongest work compositionally, it's, it's very meaningful to me in terms of the, the, place, the place that it holds in, in, my, in my life journey. Um, I've worked with um, musicians. So this piece and this piece are both based on songs that a musician wrote that, that he asked me to create work that was inspired by his so, music. When a, when a sketchbook is done, I date the year and I also have an overwhelming feeling about that year and there's a word that comes up. So for me this year, um, my sketchbook is transitions. I have to make it show up more on the binding. Um, and so sometimes you'll see all the little papers sticking out of them. Sometimes I go back <laughs> to them, um, but oftentimes I don't. And I don't get rid of them. Like I said, I knew exactly where to find my sketchbooks from childhood. I knew exactly where they were. Um, so, yeah. I, I, as long as I have my uh, microphone on, I just want to say how inspiring your life and works are. And I hope maybe you'll consider giving a complete six week course uh, with the <laughs> learning. Lab. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I uh, resource page for you that I'll pull up. Um, I have a website, I have Instagram accounts, um, and you have my email. So 